so today, um, if I may start, I want to talk about um, some of my older work and some of the newer direction that we'll be heading. Uh, and I couldn't figure out what to talk about, so I just came up with this particular title, The What and Why of Human Eye AI. Uh, and thank you for organizing this uh, interesting uh, workshop. Um, so as, as I have, I'm Gordon Chang, so I'm at the Technical University, not too far away from where you are. And um, that's why the, a lab tour would have been um, uh, appropriate to offer you. Maybe next time. Okay. So currently I have the chair for cognitive system, uh, but I have multiple passion. Um, I like cognitive system and I'll explain some of that to you. And, um, and since I've been in Munich, I've been interested in uh, a particular paradigm called neuroengineering, uh, which bring engineering and neuroscience together. And, but from a, a rather uh, alternate perspective, uh, putting more engineering emphasis um, on how to study neuroscience in the brain. And, um, and that's one of the reasons why we started this uh, elite master program for neuroengineering. And uh, we're training a, a whole bunch of uh, students who are technically competent and also at the same time can talk about the brain. Uh, and these are very rare uh, specimens that I, I couldn't find enough of them in Munich. So I thought we, we better train our own. That's why the motivation of this. Okay, so I'm going to flip my uh, acknowledgement. I always acknowledge my group at the beginning. Uh, uh, these are some of the wonderful people I've been working together with, and we go across um, many disciplines and, uh, and also very international. Um, I'm sure we speak more than 11 languages, and we cut across all the different disciplines from psychology, cognitive neuroscience, uh, all the way to computer science uh, and, and, and uh, typical engineering, and more and more uh, moving into medicine now. Okay. Um, and that was the people, and now the, um, the AI I talk about is usually about, it's embodied, uh, and we put them on, on robots. Uh, and uh, that's how we actually uh, frame our um, uh, research in this particular way. Okay, so these are our robots. So I just give you some uh, fundamental background on why I'm doing this or what are my intention. Um, so the, one of the holy uh, well, it's um, have a better understanding of human science, in particular neuroscience. How does the brain deal with complex environment and how, how do we actually act within the environment and how do we interact with the environment? Uh, and at the same time, I think, I believe, and we have shown many times now over and over again, we can build better technical systems. We can actually engineer better, better system than classical engineering approach. And in the end, um, I want to help people. I want to enhance the quality of life of our many people around. Okay, so that's the particular framework that we do all our work around. Okay, so we sometimes we look at neuroscience, sometimes we look at uh, how to build engineering system, and then how do we we can apply some of these techniques to uh, enhancing people's life. Okay, so um, so I want to go more a little bit into why. And I'm usually very curious about many things. And um, about 20, more than 20 years ago, and I got into human robotics. And I always get very intrigued by children running into the lab and instinctively, why do they know how to in interact with a human robot? Okay. So I asked this question over and over again for about two, three years. And then, um, and then we decided to do a study. Uh, and the study was to uh, see, okay, to understand human and humanoid interaction, okay? So the fundamental question we were uh, trying to understand is, is humanoid robot uh, is perceived as a human, okay? And we expect humanoid to interact in the uh, human way and human fashion. So there's some kind of, uh, uh, predecessors in there, and how human-like they need to be perceived 
is critical. And um, instead of just asking a question, I want to know how we can actually quantify such a question. Uh, and then I said, that, okay, let's see, uh, study how of um, human perception of robots. Uh, so that become one of the uh, major driving force of actually try to see if we can actually uh, synthesize human uh, human uh, response inside a human or robot. Okay, so um, the basic um, motivation is: uh, is it actually better to uh, build a human or robot or not? And how can we study this? Right, and the form factor makes something uh, interesting. Right. So it's not a normal robot, uh, an industrial robot. Uh, it has a similar form as a human. And then what kind of functionality should we have? Uh, and these become very, um, typically it's become very subjective. Uh, you ask uh, people, some, some people will tell you one thing and other people will tell you another thing. So what we were trying to derive was um, it, some kind of objective tool to verify some of these questions, right? So, um, so after asking this for about three years, a um, couple of us got together, uh, a computational neuroscientist, a uh, cognitive neuroscientist, and uh, a sports scientist, actually, and they helped me try to understand this question. Okay, so uh, we were looking at the brain. In brain science, uh, there is, um, one hypothesis is that there's a shared representation, right? That how we perceive, how we act has a very closely inter interrelated uh, relationship, right? So there seems to be some kind of shared sensory motor representation in the brain between perceiving and acting. So we thought this is a very intriguing and very interesting uh, mechanism. And uh, so we, found this particular paradigm called motor interference. So this shared representation is very interesting. It has evidence in, um, uh, in uh, uh, interference experiments. So if you're observing some action, it interferes your execution of your action with the same body part. If you're congruent or incongruent with each other, that you're, opposed, you're doing something similar or you're doing something in quite different to each other. And the other evidence um, is uh, Professor uh, Vesalati uh, talks about, it is uh, when you perceive and when you act, it seems to uh, have this form uh, that firing similar premotor neurons, uh, which he, he, kind of, he called this the motor neuron. Uh, so there's many evidence in the brain that tells us that um, there is some kind of shared representation uh, in our brain about how we perceive and how we act. So we thought about this and how we can actually study this. And then we found one particular study done in, um, I think it's UCL in London. So um, Keller uh, did this study in 2003. Uh, so what she was doing is um, having a robot and a human face to face, right? And have the robots uh, moving in vertical and the human moving in vertical, like moving your arm up and down, right? Or moving your arm side to side, right? And the evidence showed is that if you are a human and human interacting, right? If you are, at the, uh, you know, going up and down together, there's no interference, of course. But if you're going up and down and the other person is going left, left and right, right? It's uh, induced some kind of uh, incongruent movement and it, it shows some evidence of uh, interference. But what surprised us most was um, when we saw this particular figure, she shied it with a robot, right? And she said that with a robot, there's not much different, okay? And we were very surprised, okay? Uh, we didn't believe it. So we thought we'd do it ourselves, okay? So we started looking at some of these ideas, right? But we, we decided to put our own robot together, but we put our humanoid in place, right? And what we did was um, in, uh, we did diagonal movement, right? Human, human, either you're together 
or you're in imposing it, opposing each other. Okay, and we did the same similar thing for a uh, humanoid robot. So the the action looks something like this. So you have the robot moving similar in motion as uh, human. Sometimes it's going congruent, and sometimes it's going incongruent. Okay. So, uh, so by doing this, we thought it's an interesting factor. We can record the movement of the subject and the movement of the robot, and we can actually synthesize uh, different kind of motion of the of the robot. Okay, and to analyze if there's any kind of interference, right? What we were doing, we we're just looking at the deviation, right? How much variant is there? Doing the movement, right? This gives us some kind of interference, right? And this is just a simple ANOVA uh, test uh, to show that, you know, if you're moving and, and it, you don't deviate too much, then you, the robot is not interfering with you, right? That's a basic uh, premises, okay? And what we found was that in our case, using a human and a humanoid um, a robot, it's do induce some kind of interference, okay? The magnitude is not as high, but it does do induce similar uh, observation. And we went back to look at how um, uh, Keller's study uh, did it. They used just a normal industrial robot arm with a blanket. Uh, you might as well just use some kind of uh, uh, a slider going up and down. It, it wouldn't make any difference, which makes sense. Uh, but in our case, we thought the human shape and the actually synthesizing the actual human movement uh, do induce some form of interference that is similar to human-human interaction, okay? Um, so this is one way of us just um, uh, asking, you know, why would you use a humanoid robot for interaction? Uh, it, and it does make some sense. And our study do combine the form and the motion. And what was important for us is our, um, that human, I mean, many studies also show that we're very sensitive biological motion. Uh, so in our case, our human robot, we could actually synthesize the actual biological movement uh, as well as the form itself. So um, this uh, gave us some hope and actually help us study or utilize the human robot to study more, uh, more the social complement interaction. Okay, so this is roughly the first one third of uh, the story I want to tell you today. Okay, um, so um, that was very interesting. That was very nice. Uh, we I wanted something that I can quantify and objectively measure. Um, and more recently, um, I'm moving towards more, even uh, more stronger coupling into neuroscience. Um, and I will not talk about that today here. Um, there's a new paper I just uh, wrote in um, Science about, it, about uh, this particular paradigm that we're shifting a lot towards um, the fusion between robotic and neuroscience and what are the challenges involved. And some of the challenges is uh, how do you actually measure, directly measure the brain to actually see if we can actually, um, you know, uh, get um, signal for interference, uh, non-interference. And we do a lot of these studies, like um, in um, there's a particular paradigm called uh, error-related potential, right, which um, also fits very well with the, uh, our earlier study with uh, human human uh, interaction and human robot interaction. Okay, um, so a lot of these uh, past work has been uh, uh, synthesized in a book for um, Human Robot and Neuroscience Science Engineering Society. Uh, that's a plug for my uh, publisher. Okay, so um, so this gave me a. Um, some kind of uh, direction in um, uh, synthesizing or utilizing humanoid to study the brain, okay? So I thought we need a platform to actually help us study better to, um, towards some kind of uh, understanding of the brain and what are the underlying mechanisms and utilizing the humanoid to actually build some of these uh, models 
and neutralize, situate these um, uh, robot in a very human-like uh, situation for these studies. Okay, so um, about almost twenty years ago, I think two thousand and one, I started talking about building a new humanoid robot, and then uh, to actually help us study the brain. Okay. And um, I think 2001, I started talking about it. And then uh, about 2007, I finished. Uh, so uh, it took a long time. And this is what we ended up with. Uh, a full-size humanoid robot. When I say full-size, it's my size. OK. I didn't mean to change it, but you, you dragged it up. I didn't it. Okay, this was, um, I, I have to say, in robotic, once we, uh, most people finish the platform, that's the result, that's the end, okay? They reach their goal, okay? For me, after seven years, this was the beginning, okay? I said, what can I do with this? And how can I use this robot to study all kinds of things, right? Walking, running, uh, uh, visual, uh, uh, seeing, uh, synthesizing uh, biological motion in that way, okay, and manipulation. Okay, so how does the brain do it, and how can we actually uh, utilize such system to help us build more realistic model and validate these uh, kind of model? Okay, one of the earliest things that uh, we did was um, do things like full body interaction. Okay, so back in the old day, you will never ever go near a robot and try to push it about and try to interact with it physically. Okay, because uh, these kind of robots will actually crush you. Okay, and nowadays you have your Boston Dynamic robot. Um, we did this back in 2007. Okay, so what is the uniqueness of this was I went for state of the art. Okay, I said I want a humanoid robot, 50, this end up to be 50 degree of freedom, okay? Uh, 30 degree of freedom or joint, right, was completely force controllable, okay? And then I even built a vesicular system, the inner ear, uh, the same model as the inner ear, to help study how the balancing can, uh, can actually be realized. Uh, so this is a realistic functional model of the uh, cochlea and the superior colliculosis, which integrate the movement for the balancing. Okay. So, so that was very interesting, okay. Um, we did a lot of work, we did many, many work. I'll show parts of this. Um, so that gave us something very interesting. And then um, historically, um, this is about the time I got offered a chair in Munich. Okay. And I sadly had to leave this robot in Kyoto, but um, we did a, we we understood a lot. Okay, and then I walked away from this uh, particular robot, and then I said what I was not happy with and how what I could not study. Right, and one of the things was um, in robotics you can actually control the joint torque, right, uh, as a state of the art. Now it's much more common. Back in uh, 2007 was not common whatsoever. Maybe a handful of robots had it, and there definitely no humanoid robot in the world had it. So this was, uh, we made a state of the art humanoid robot that you can actually joint torque control, like muscle. Okay. Okay, so I left um, Kyoto, I moved to Munich, and then uh, one of the first questions somebody asked me, uh, what would you do first? And the only word I said was skin, okay? Uh, so if you look at this particular diagram in human, right? Uh, I think more in the context of um, what you're talking about here, the social bridge, uh, social interaction, there's a lot of contact involved, okay? Uh, whole body interaction, when you're climbing a wall, right? when you're holding an object, when you're classifying uh, ob uh, object, you're monitoring your body, Right? It's all about contact and skin, okay? So, but 
have to ask the question. Uh, this is uh, around 2010. Okay, this is already 11 years ago. Okay, um, and I said, why? The question was, why hasn't any human or robot or any robot on Earth have skin, functional skin, sensitive skin, and then working skin, and then help you do many things that we do more commonly? Okay. Um, and I found out that it is uh, very difficult to construct skin. Uh, and uh, we, we will go through a lot of these little detail. Okay, so I always um, look around for technology um, and I said, can I buy anything? I couldn't find anything I could buy. So I wasn't happy. So I said, okay, let's build it. Okay, but at the, at the beginning, let's see, what do we need? We need something that has similar functionality as a human, a human skin. Right, and we need the actual processing functionality as a um, uh, skin receptor and how the brain will process this. So um, it didn't exist. So we looked at biology, right? Uh, most of the um, sensor or they call skin that you could buy in robotic or in any kind of uh, technology, uh, it gives you about major function is touch on, off, how much I'm being touched, okay? And that's it. And then nobody actually put a surface together, okay? So um, what we did was, uh, okay, looked at biology and say, what can we, uh, how can we build it? Okay, so I couldn't buy it, so we started building it. Um, we come up with all the different um, uh, modality, the key modality that you need. Um, of course, uh, pressure, you, you, know, you feel the pressure, and temperature is a, is a normal thing. And acceleration is more the vibration. We are very sensitive to vibration, our, our um, skin. And, um, and we put in proximity because we actually feel before we touch. Right? A lot of time, we, I mean, you're touching your hair. You actually feel before you touch. Okay? A lot of these come from this proximity. Right? So we thought, okay, these are the basic. I want a multimodal like human, right? or as close as possible. Right? We looked at all these. And the human is very interesting. So um, pre-touch, we need that. Right. Uh, oops. OK. Vibration, right. we're acting to vibration. Temperature, right. so you can end up blowing on the uh, industrial robot arm. Okay. And you can pre-touch by controlling a robot with a handkerchief. Okay. And um, it's a lot of very interesting uh, factor. I mean, this is 2011, where we published this paper. Then you can actually have multi-contact and multi-touch control of an industrial arm right, just by putting skin on it. Right. So this kind of shifts the paradigm a bit in robotics. And how smart you can actually make these ro uh, robots in skin, it's really become the major challenge. Okay. So this sense of touch. Um, okay, this is uh, just a demonstration. This is like seven, we put seven sensor on, seven uh, sensor cell on a robot industrial arm and say, can we actually control it? Okay, that's interesting. That was a very nice proof of concept. Okay. But if you think about the human body, Right. There is six million, roughly six million. Some people, some textbooks say five million, but it's in the million receptors on our body. Right. And these are all connected together. Right. And they are redundant network. And it's a large surface. I think it's uh, between 1.3 square meter to 1.5 square meter, depending on the size of the body. Right. And um, a lot of the functionality in the old day is that uh, if you put a sensor on a robot, uh, the student or the engineer have to say, I mark X, Y, Z, this is the location of each sensor cell, right? But if you think about 5 million receptor or 1.3 square meter, right, doing that, it's, it's an enormous effort 
and it's just not feasible. And that explained partially why I couldn't find robotic skin or uh, intelligent skin enough to put on any robot. Okay. And the problem got too hard, I think. Okay. So, of course, I looked to the brain. Okay. Uh, the human body had this thing called body schema for spatial representation. And one of the most um, uh, famous picture it is a uh, sensory, uh, somatic sensory uh, homoculus, right? And it seems that our brain have this map uh, in the uh, uh, somatic sensory cortex, right? And that uh, maps out how you, where every single sen uh, sensor on our body is, right? And every time we touch, the brain actually have some kind of representation. And I said, we need, uh, we need such a thing uh, this is just a technical representation. And the robot should do this automatically, okay? Without having the engineer putting the sensor on and then mapping out manually everything. We want to build it like the homoculus, right? And uh, it's a very interesting study. When you go back to um, um, uh, developmental um, uh, neuroscience as well, in the fetus, we already started learning about our body. And uh, it's actually easier to interact inside liquid to fill our, our skin sensor and our body. That means you can actually build the uh, uh, internal representation much more earlier and much more easier. Right? By being able to reconstruct the entire surface, uh, that means you can actually self-localize every single cell uh, sensor cell on your body. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's the concept we came up with. Okay. So this is basically this is a where uh, effect. Right. So we can actually know where we're being uh, touched and where we're making contact. Right. The other um, aspect is there is certain we learn certain uh, representation to how we act, how we sense, and how we act. There's certain sensory motor pair, right? That we sense, and then we we say this can be act upon which muscle, okay? So um, so there's a whole uh, whole representation of this, and what we did was um, we utilize something called motor babbling. We get the the baby or the robot baby to jiggle, right? Uh, systematically, and it start learning its own representation of where on the left, you can see that different robot, right? The nice thing is we just have these automatic skin, we throw it on the skin onto the robot, okay? And the robot jiggle, motor babble, and then it start learning some kind of sensory motor pair, right? This allows the robot to interact, right? So you can make it uh, attract or repel, based on, and it automatically know how to act and which motor or which muscle it should use to actually make the appropriate action. Right. So this is a, a one way of actually computing a lot of these things, okay? And then we started thinking about how do you uh, scale up such a system, right? Remember what I, I said that, you know, it's something like five million receptor on our body, six million receptor. So if you have a whole surface, right, you need all the basic automated scheme or self-learning scheme to actually uh, allow you to get the robot to actually uh, work in a reasonable way. Uh, these are um, a lot of the potential impact in society. Uh, we, we talk to entertainment people, sports people. Healthcare is my passion. Um, industrial automation, of course, uh, is also very natural, and of course, uh, object monitoring. In order to do things uh, nicely, you have to have very robust uh, top engineering um, effort in uh, building such skin. Skin is very robust. Uh, every time we scratch our skin, some cell die, but with the whole system or the whole skin on our body is still alive. Okay, so we went through the rigorous. Um, uh, method of look at self-organization and reconfiguration to allow the system to be much more robust. So um, we did 
24 hour cycle test. We did hammer test, knife test, um, uh, and allow the system to automatically recover on its own. Uh, this is the most extreme case. You actually nail the skin cell uh, and it dies and the whole system recover instantaneously. Okay. The instantaneous, uh, on technically, it's about 32 milliseconds. It recovers. And I think it outlasts the IKEA table that we used for the, um, for the experiment. Okay. So there's many, many applications on this, as I said. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of examples. And then uh, I want to move on to the next uh, topic. Okay, one one thing is uh, making um, turning non-compliant robot to compliant. Okay, so most robot in the world, right? If you go near it, it will not detect you. It will just crush you. Okay, this is Philip sacrificing his life for his PhD, okay. uh, and he passed with high distinction. So um, he did well. Okay, so. Um, so these kind of robot, right, without skin, it will just crush the object with, within. And uh, here are some other examples. Right. These are, now we don't, instead of human life, we said, okay, what about standard industrial arm? Can we do this? Can we cover right, one whole arm with skin, right, or two whole arms with skin? How would that work? Right. And how would that function? Right. And how would you process all these information? Right. So the cell configuration really, really helps. Right. You strap it on, you let it jiggle, and it works out in thing, and then it starts uh, interacting. Right. So it's almost instantaneous. So one of the hardest things that we um, end up doing was, um, what if you want to scale this up? Right. We did one industrial arm, right, and then we went to two industrial arms, Okay, and remember our, our um, what I was saying that there is six million receptor on our body. That's a lot of information. If you use engineering approach, it does not work. It does not scale, right? So with one industrial arm, we use one computer. With two industrial arm, we got two computers. Okay, and then what if I want to go to a whole humanoid? Right, it it will not scale. Right? I will need the whole room full of computer to actually process the information. Okay. So what we did was uh, we changed the scheme completely for a whole humanoid robot. Right? So when we covered the whole humanoid robot, what we did was um, we change we changed the power line completely. Right? And we looked at how the skin on our on the human body does it. Okay, so in the on the on our body, right? It, okay, let me flip the other way first. In engineering, is what you do is ask the ask the sensor, give me your data, give me your data, give me your data. But if you have six million receptor, right, you'll be asking this six million time, right, and then you hope you get an answer, right. And this go into a loop, normal engineering practice. In our body, on our body, or with our brain, right, we do not send six million receptor information to our brain, right? It will be a lot of burden on our brain. Our brain will overload tremendously, right? So we change the scheme, right? On our body, we never send information unless there's a change, right? So if I'm wearing this shirt, if I don't get any information to our brain about any change in, uh, in on my skin unless I jiggle my shirt. Now, now all this information, contact information, gets sent to the brain. Okay. So we came up with a very elaborate scheme to actually uh, cover the whole human robot. Okay. This is the first human robot in the world that had full cover human uh, uh, tactile skin. Uh, I think we reach one square meter, close to one square meter of skin on the body. Okay. And um, you can do a lot of interaction and a lot of very interesting things on that. Okay. So, so that's about sensor. I'm gradually changing the topic. So I'm, if there's no um, immediate questions, I will go to the next question, uh, next topic. Okay. Um, 
So uh, over the last three years, we asked ourselves lots of different questions. Right? How does human transfer skill, task and skill to other human? Okay. So, and how, do, how can we do this on a humanoid robot? Right. So it's, a, it's the same question. How does human do it? And how, how, does human, how can we do this utilizing a humanoid robot to validate any of our hypotheses? Okay. So um, I think two years ago, I summarized this in a, in a 20 year discussion I had with a dear friend of mine, Professor Konyoshi in Tokyo University. Okay. Uh, they, we had this discussion for about 20 years. Okay. So um, this is a conjugate, um, this different strategy that we take in learning from others. Okay. Uh, you see this different uh, style of learning. You have a little bit of trial, uh, the youngest one, learn from appearance, and then the little bit older, learn from action, and then the little bit um, uh, more older, learn from the purpose of observing mama. Okay. So I'm, I'll take you through this tour of these kind of um, uh, scheme. Okay. So the objective is if you observe somebody, I wish I can do that, okay? The robot or the human, right? But how will we do that, right? Uh, the example in Munich is how do you pour beer, okay? And you observe, right? And then we, we looked at different strategy and also technical strategy and um, human strategy is very similar actually. We have different examples throughout the stages, okay? The first one is little child, look at the appearance and just move like the mama. Okay, right. that's it. Sensory motor coupling, and then it's just a direct action movement, copying, okay. And then we, use, we can actually look at this. We can actually do the similar things. If you observe somebody dancing, right, what do you do? You just directly map uh, their movement onto the robot, right? And this is a very, very convenient way of doing this, okay? So we took the video camera, observed the, um, the Okinawan dancing uh, uh, instructor, and then just map it directly onto the robot, right? So that's very convenient and very easy. Oh, to some extent it's easy. Direct copying is very convenient, okay? So the little child has a good point there. Okay. And also it's the same way, right? You can actually do this in a multimodal way. And um, one of the things we've been talking about is imitation learning or mimicking. Right? Uh, here's a one example of that. You can actually utilize this same strategy for actually mimicking somebody and observing somebody and then just mimic the, what the person is doing. Uh, uh, this is an experiment I did uh, when I was at maybe 20 years younger. I don't remember, okay. So that's the premises for the initial bootstrapping of imitation learning, okay. So the second strategy we were advocating or uh, categorized is um, action learning, right. What do you do? You watch somebody, uh, when you're older, you have certain repertoire that you have yourself, right. Uh, the example I like to use is um, playing a musical instrument or uh, playing tennis. You learn how to do, you know, forehand, backhand, right, love, right, these things. You learn, you have these repertoire. And what you do, you just execute. You observe and you try to map that onto some kind of uh, execution. Okay. So these are very interesting, right? I say you learn from observation about the dynamic situation and then you try to actually extract some kind of primitive, right? And then you learn how to select this. And here's an example of um, a, a student I had um, some years ago. So you observe somebody playing a game of air hockey, or two people going, and what you do is learn the basic forehand, backhand, right, straight. Right? And that's how the robot actually learned the basic. Right. So the action learning strategy makes sense. Right. When you're thinking about uh, um, learning how to behave or act in this way, 
okay? So these are the um, some of the earlier thinking, right? We went from appearance, what it looked like, and then to what it, what I, how I should act or selecting what I should do, right? Based on what I know, okay? So um, I'm gonna show you this um, video I love very much. Okay, it is working. You make these golden fluffy pancakes, add flour, milk, and eggs. This for my still lumpy. <laughs> Marvelous! Mm, four crisp yet moist potatoes, brown on one side, then turn over. Mm, this will be some good slap. Is something burning? Morning! Oh, number five! Good morning! Sleep well? You're making me breakfast, mm. aren't you? Pancake surprise! Okay. So, um, this. I love this scene for multiple reasons. Right? Even if you have capable robots, right, there is something still missing. Right? Many of the robots can actually perform some of these tasks already, some of these basic tasks already. But um, there is something missing. And um, so the final stage of this story was, um, I did a paper um, just a couple of years ago. It's called Purposive Learning. Robot reasoning about meaning of human action. So your ob observation, and back to this particular picture, um, we go to the last stage, right? So the older boy, right, would actually try to extract the meaning of the action and then have the ability of reuse, uh, have the reusable knowledge to actually perform the actual task and the meaning of the task. And I say this is a, one of the most powerful way of actually learning. And all of us over life, we already done this, right? And most of the audience is probably all adults. We're doing this all the time, okay? But in the robotic sense, many of them have no clue, right? What he's doing and why he's doing it or extracting any kind of meaning from it. So this takes to, to the last stage of this 20 year discussion. Okay, so the difficulty is um, most robots learn in this way, right? They observe, they picked out some kind of mapping and they do, okay? That's very close to the first action, right? The first appearance, you look at it and then you do some kind of action and then you try to actually extract some kind of meaning and then perform that particular uh, task, okay? And then what we were looking at is, um, can you actually look at these and then um, have some kind of understanding of your observation and then utilize some kind of uh, semantic learning or reasoning to actually make uh, things like multiple robots do the same thing or we learn or we use some of the knowledges, okay? So I'll give you an example of this. Okay, this is three subjects that we decide to observe. Okay, and it's very interesting. All three of them, what we said was cut the bread. Okay, so we can make sandwiches. Okay, uh, one of them using the uh, left hand, one of them using the right hand. The center one is the, it's the coolest. She will take the bread. Okay. So if you learn the old uh, uh, appearance level, right, what you do is just, you exactly mimic each one of these, right? But all these are exactly the same. They have the same purpose. All they're doing is just cutting a couple of slices of bread for making the sandwich, right? So we thought, can we actually make an AI system or a semantic representation to do similar? Right? Learn the semantic rules, uh, and see if we can actually look from any kind of observation, right? And then transform these into some kind of high level cognitive representation to actually use it 
uh, these common knowledge to actually make uh, the robot a bit smarter. Okay, this is a um, technical representation. You observe the trajectory and then you try to um, extract some kind of a, uh, uh, atomic uh, high level and low level um, action that you can actually utilize the reasoning. So to anatomically, these are the most basic. You're moving, you're not moving. You're using a tool, you have something in your hand or you're acting on something, okay? Very basic, so the most primitive way. And what we did was a uh, build. <laughs> Oops. We built an AI engine to actually extract some of these basics, and then we built some kind of a tree structure, some kind of action tree, to actually use that for reasoning and to actually uh, make sense of the action. Right? If you if you don't have a like, for example, if you have an object in your hand, no, yes, no, right? Uh, that you have you have no motion, right? If you have an object, you're taking something, right? Object in the hand. If you have an object, put it somewhere, right? you put something down, right? or you have it in your hand, you either release it or you're reaching for it. Right? So basic, very, very simple semantic rules. So we started generating a lot of these. And what we started doing was capturing a lot of human movement to actually see if we can actually utilize some of these action to learn from them. Right? And one of the most important thing we wanted to study is um, can we actually reuse the knowledge for other tasks right, or other situations? Right? This is an um, extraction of the, um, uh, the bread making example I showed you earlier, or cutting the bread. Uh, and these are the action tree uh, the, uh, the system end up learning or synthesizing. Okay. And then the nice thing is um, you can actually learn, utilize the same tree and we learn, uh, not we learn, learn new tasks, right? So they say, I don't know what you're doing, right? Can you tell me what you're doing? What is your net new activity? They say pouring and that synthesize a new node on the tree, right? Then you have all these trees that you can build from prior knowledge and you can actually uh, consecutively learn new tasks. Okay. So um, we showed that you can do it with uh, do it um, asymmetrically with two hands, uh, not just one. You learn from one hand, and then you can actually utilize the symmetry to learn from uh, from the second hand. That means the left and right hand the person would not make any difference, and we don't have to relearn the whole thing again. Okay. Uh, anyway, this is a um, kind of recognition we got. The three subjects that we got. Um, somehow the left-handed style um, had, the accuracy was not as high, but it, it will increase uh, over time. Okay, so this is uh, one way of actually building up these kind of reasoning engine to actually do this uh, observation, you observe, and then you start learning and execute on the robot. Oops. So anyway, you get the point. There's uh, these observations. I'm running low on time, so I want to speed up a little bit. Uh, so you can see this, and then we just transformed that particular action to the robot, and the robot started doing um, cutting the bread. So the beautiful thing, that, that was almost instantaneous. We got the robot after a week, and we got it to work to actually tra translate these particular action. Okay. So there's other um, activity um, that you can actually do. You can imagine having a factory or something. You can teach a robot differently in a, with a different style. Right. Teach it by uh, combining what I show you of the robotic skin and then combining the AI engine to actually teach a robot. Uh, in this particular example, it's the, um, picking the orange. Um, I'll let you think about this. Um, so when they sort oranges, right, the packer will usually squeeze the orange. Uh, if it's firm, it puts it in the box to distribution. If it's not, 
it puts it in a separate pile for juicing. Okay. So I'll let, I'll let you think about what you're drinking when you're uh, getting iron juice next time. Okay. And so we thought we'd do this task for the robot to utilize the skin and also the uh, AI engine to actually learn the whole task. Right. And the robot start doing all this um, very easily. And um, so this is, um, and it, the beautiful thing is you can actually utilize the whole AI engine for the robot to be taught. And um, to our surprise, um, we could execute this with different objects, adopt to new object and execution of the process by using two hands. And what is the nicest thing for us was um, understanding how you would recover from a task without redoing, restarting the whole process again, right? So the robot can actually uh, detect the error and then we do the task and recover, basically. And um, this is similar to the action uh, sequence that a human would do this, right? So um, you can, we can do it on observation or we can actually uh, teach the robot, okay? So if I would give you a lab tour, I will show you this new system we have which we use to light virtual reality right, to learn action. Right? So we have many users. We set up a kitchen environment in, in virtual reality. And all we told them is that go and wash dishes. Okay. And then the mobile or the AI system start building up these activity transition graph right, instantaneously. Right? to learn the action sequence of all the subjects. Right. And they start creating plans for these. And what we did was um, combine, it, this is really nice because we can actually shift a lot of these uh, to 10 subject and 20 subject and start making common sense graph. Right. And utilize these common sense graph right, because not everybody will do it, everything the same. And some of them will be uh, rubbish action anyway, and you throw them out. Right? And then um, we get the um, send these kind of uh, action graph to the robot after it learned from 10 people, right? and then it start doing the washing the dishes. Right? So this is a transition between um, uh, why I wanted to do human or robot. It's very hard and it makes sense for interaction, to making skin that nobody has, to actually work out the whole different uh, strategy of human learning and how we actually validate uh, some of these uh, model onto human uh, robots, okay? So I'm gonna stop there because I'm over time. I thank you and um, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, this was Absolutely amazing. I'm pretty much speechless. I can't wait for an opportunity to visit your lab if one arises. Please, come over. <laughs> I would love to. Um, okay, we have um, quite a few questions here. Um, let me start with the first one. Um, okay, what about designing artificial sensors that could be used by humans, similar to wearable robotics, but possibly more integrated into human sensing? Uh, like smart skin, that is was addition to the question. Okay. Uh, I suppose uh, it's a, is it possible to enhance human skin using some of your work on robots? Yes, yes. Um, so I, I'll show you this next mm -hmm. one. Um, this experiment is <laughs> a it's a. Uh, it's, uh, was done with a, a paraplegic uh, spinal cord injury patient. Okay, they have no sense; they cannot feel anymore, and they cannot move anymore. And what we did was use the skin to provide them with the feedback. When they're touching the ground, uh, it starts sending them sensation on the uh, upper arm or the shoulder to actually um, enhance their ability to sense that they're touching the ground. Okay. So uh, in the same 
Well, I'm using this for medical reasons, right? To actually retrain a, a spinal cord injury patient to walk, okay? But um, at the same time, you can actually amplify or change the uh, sensitivity of the skin for other uh, modality on the human, right? And uh, you can include a sixth sense on human, right? Uh, longer distance sensing, right? So that, um, we try this with patients. I'm sure we can actually do this with um, uh, normal, any kind of uh, sensor. Does that answer the question? Did I get, did I get that right? I think so. Uh, it makes sense to me, <laughs> but uh, I, I'll see if uh, I'll see if we have a follow up on that. But let me jump to the next one. Um, we are currently working on perceptual co-representation, where the mere presence of a human impacts perceptual judgments. Do you do you think something like this can be mirrored in robots, with robots? Sorry. So I suppose you, that relates to the first part of your talk. Okay. So the you mean uh, the the mere presence of a human can impact our perceptual judgments. Yes. Do you think something like this can be mirrored with robots? Uh, I think so. I think so. Um, I didn't show it. They, we have some EG study that we have uh, robot and human interacting, and we are modifying the behavior of the machine according to the error-related potential, right? So that means the presence of the human, right, that the robot will sense in a way, really utilizing the brain signal to alter its own behavior, right? So in that way, I, I, I prefer that actually, because that's no longer subjective. It's no longer a subjective uh, uh, presence of a um, human or a robot. And uh, we do, uh, I, I think we do amplify or simplify with robots over time. Did I get that? Yeah, I think Maybe so. I should read the text. <laughs> yes, uh, Louis says, yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, let me ask you the next question. Do you take also some inspiration from non-human animals? Non-human animal? Um, yes, sometimes. Uh, rat. For instance, uh, the um, the hippocampus about mapping, right? uh, about navigation, right? a lot of that has been uh, validated. Um, the central pattern generator, which is uh, in the spinal cord, that's very much studied in the cats, uh, disabled little cat. Um, we do model a lot of these things. I just have a bias for human. At all, but uh, we do computational model for a lot of these different other things as well. And every so often, I ask people to build me a spider or something just for. We're building a dog actually. May I just add? Can I can I just ask why do you have a bias for human? Pardon? Why do you have a bias for human? Uh, technically, it's hard, and I just think it's fascinating. And it's, it's, it's interesting to study the social aspect and the interaction aspect for human. And technically, it is one of the hardest things to do. You have two legs walking. Uh, it's already an unstable system. Uh, an animal with four legs is much, uh, in a way, easier to control. Uh, so it's, it's probably more of the difficulty I, I like. And yeah, it's kind of fun. <laughs> Nice. Uh, we are running out of time, but let me sneak in one more last question. Um, in, this relates to the first part of your talk. Okay. In, in, in practical interactions with robots, are there scenarios in which we definitely would not like robots to be humanoid? Um, you prefer humans to be humanoid. In a, a collaborative task, when you're working together, right, uh, having the human is easier to um, uh, interact with. Uh, that's what we're showing in the first stage. Uh, the interaction is easier. Right? And, um, but you have, then you have certain expectation 
Uh, you're expecting the robot to behave in a particular way. Okay? So uh, I think that would be one uh, scenario working together. And also um, the humanoid robot actually has another function that because most of the entire world that we built is for human, right? then that means uh, it's easier to situate a humanoid robot in the environment. All right, so that's the other argument for that. I think the interaction should be easier. And also, uh, also the environment is already catered for human. 